Hello everyone and welcome once again to another CK3 Developer Diary. This time we are going to be talking about performance and AI and uh, well I, I can just I can see already some of the comments it's gonna be something like make sure you enable multi-threading and make sure that CK3 uses more than just one core and all of these other like ignorant comments that from people who believe the myth that Paradox games only use one core and that hasn't been true since before Victoria 2 um, yeah no they're, they're all multi-core they, they always they always have been U4 is always multi-core CK2 has always been multi-core it's just it's just the way it is anyway let's get into the dev diary shall we good afternoon everyone i am magna meneth sharon uh and uh, we've had him on the no cb podcast before brilliant guest awesome guy uh he's one of the programmers on ck3 you might know me from my work on ck2 and the paradox wikis a particular relevance today is my work on performance and ai in ck2 Today I'm going to talk about how we've worked with these two areas in CK3 to ensure a better game experience than CK2. So, starting off with performance. Over the course of CK2's lifestyle... It's lifestyle? No, it's life cycle. Close enough. We made numerous improvements to performance, and when Holy Fury released, it was the best it's ever been. Uh, that that's, that's kind of awesome to know, really, um, that even after adding so much content and i mean ck2 got a lot of additional content it, the, the speed of the game actually improved which is it's actually kind of insane to think about the released version today feels like molasses compared to how the game performs after its long and venerated life. Sega 2 has been a standout among PDS's games when it comes to performance, which means we have a lot to live up to. As such, performance has been a priority throughout the development of CK3, and especially as it is neared release. Our approach to a number of tech systems differ from CK2 for the sake of performance, and this has given us some great results. Good, that's good to know. I, I, I do like great results. The two systems that differ most from CK2 for the sake of performance are threading and rendering. Oh god, he said the dreaded threading word. Again, those comments are oh, make it multi-threaded. I can hear them already. The two are heavily intertwined, so much so that you can't really talk about one without talking about the other. In CK2, our approach was pretty simple. The game as a whole was structured around the main thread. The main task of the main thread was to update the game state so the, uh, so the game progresses. In order to render frames so the users can see what's going on, it would periodically stop updating the game state in order to make a frame instead. The rendering would then take over entirely until done with the frame. So if, uh, if you didn't have to play and just the AI was going to play itself, then it'd be fine. It would never have to stop, um, you know updating the game state just to render a frame for you because that, that's basically it it would it would play so much better clearly um during game state updates it would uh thread a large number of different operations the way we structured this in ck2 was largely based around the characters themselves the daily update for characters were split into a handful of segments with different rules for parallelization for instance during one part it would be illegal for one character to check any information that belongs to another character it's, it's illegal mate yeah, the coppers will be after you. That's, that's just that's just the rules. It's the law, clearly. During another, it would be illegal. That, <laughs> can you not just say it's, it wouldn't be possible? It's like it's illegal. It's just not legal for it to happen. And if it does, oh, off to code jail. Oh God, love it. And during another, it would be illegal for it to change any information it owns that is visible to other characters. These restrictions meant that these updates could be done in parallel. Oh, using more than one core. That's illegal. <laughs> Each thread doing the same section for another character. In a different character, sorry. In practice, it worked reasonably well. CK2 is heavily parallel game and has had significant speed games from increased parallelization. Similar setups were applied to other objects too, like titles and plots, etc. However, there are also some significant drawbacks. The biggest one being the various rules on what the programmer can and cannot do in each update. Violating any one of these rules is illegal, <laughs> would generally result in an out of sync, breaking the multiplayer experience. And yeah, CK2 was pretty, pretty bad for out of syncs early on. It was, it was, it was actually kind of awful. Uh, it did get a lot, lot better, 
Uh, obviously, they they fix out of sync problems every update for like almost all of their games. Um, CK2 no different, but uh, yeah, early on out of syncs really crippled CK2 multiplayer. Occasionally, it could even crash the game. There was also a significant overhead in having to process every character in the game, with most checks just resulting in, we have no need to do this part of the update. So, in CK3, we replaced this system entirely. We moved from object-level parallelism to system-level parallelism. Now, instead of processing several characters at the same time, we instead process several different systems. For instance, we might update the scheme system at the same time as the opinion system. This allowed us to simplify the rules of what you can and cannot do massively. Now, during parallelism, the only limitation is that we can't change any visible information. We must instead store the changes we want to do and then apply them a bit later in the series. Simplifying the rules means that fewer bugs are introduced, particular, uh, sorry, in particular, out of syncs's out of out of syncs close enough um and it tends to be easier to identify what could be paralyzed parallelized not paralyzed it's a different thing entirely than it was in ck2 resulting in more work being done in parallel than before so uh, this is a chart time spent on most of the parallel updates uh and so let's have a look at this here can i just have it make it big there we go so, uh, we've got characters, opinions, actions, AI, council, relations, guests, holdings, dynasties, units, schemes, secrets, armies, vassals, wars, factions, cultures, modifiers. I wonder if I would like to see this graph at various points in the game. Um, because I have a feeling that things like armies are going to be armies and units say um are going to be a bigger slice of you know the the amount of time taken to process um later in the game than it is in the early game i think this graph may be different uh in you know 867 versus 1350 i i have a feeling those are going to be different uh but even so you can see probably the biggest uh, the, the most intensive part is on actions, um, on opinions, and on characters. Uh, seems to be the biggest three. Maybe modifiers as well uh, thrown in there. But yeah, no, it looks. Uh, I, I I don't know how to read this. Really, this just I, I, graph. If you understand graph, then graph good. Yes. <laughs> Furthermore, this works great with CK3's new approach to rendering. In CK3, rendering is a separate thread rather than done on the main thread. It still needs to synchronize a lot with the main thread, as you can't be checking an object that's being changed. So we have a system of locks. When the thread renderer, sorry, when the render thread needs to access the game state, the game state isn't allowed to change itself. And when the game state is changing itself, the render thread must wait until it can access the game state. Similarly to CK2, the game state will, while updating itself, periodically check if the render thread needs access, in which case it will hand off control for a short while. But the big difference is that a significant part of the work done on the render thread does not require any access to the game state, and thus can be done in parallel with the game state update. And do you remember the rule I mentioned earlier? Do you mean the law? It's illegal to illegal to violate. The parallel updates to the game state aren't allowed to change visible state. So during these updates, it's safe to update the render thread. So overall, the section where the render thread might have to wait is pretty small, and it ends up doing most of its work at the same time as the game state. That seems reasonable to me. Um, one thing works when the other thing can't, and then when it needs to work, then it'll work. But if it doesn't need to work, then it doesn't need to do it, and it won't. That's good. No more of this. Um, we have no need to do this part of the update. That that seems like a getting rid of those is, is probably going to be very good for the game. Um, also, it just makes you realize just how much goes into making these games um, like function. Like, I'm sure you could make the game function without all of this back-end, you know, game state and threading and renderingness, but it would chug like hell and you wouldn't, it would be unplayable. Like, this is essential, really, uh, to make uh, the game work. And, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of the thing that goes unnoticed and kind of unappreciated by the general public. It's, it's, it's like, 
and I think I've made this analogy before, but it's like CGI in movies, right? When it's done well, it's invisible. Um, and you're, you're not instantly like, oh, that's CGI. When it's done well, it's invisible. It's same in here. When this kind of optimization is done well, it's invisible. It's only when it's done badly that it jumps out at you and it's like, oh, the, this game is not optimized. It's only when it's a, a done badly that you realize that it's a thing at all. So, yeah. No, this is looking good. Um, nice. Uh, overall, these changes have meant that CK3 has better thread utilization than CK2, a more stable frame rate, and it's harder for programmers to make threading mistakes that lead to bugs out of syncs and crashes. Good. Uh, for a point of comparison, I did a quick test on my machine comparing CK2 and CK3. I simply let the game run at full speed for a minute and compared the frame rate and how far the game progressed. Both games got equally far in. Starting in September 1066, they both got to April 1069. However, CK3's frame rate was much higher and more stable than CK2's. Considering CK3's far better graphics, these results are exactly what I was hoping for. Let's take a look at the difference that threading makes. I set up a simple test. I ran the game for one minute on my machine at max speed, first with the threading fully enabled, then with threading disabled. You can see for yourself below. Left is with threading, right is without. All right, let's uh, pop this back to the beginning, and you can <laughs> you can see what I've been watching. Um, but anyway, let's, let's have this open. Can I do full screen? No, apparently not. But I wanna, so let's do that. So, um, it looks like the, is the red bar frame rate? Oh God, yeah, the, the difference there is insane. And uh, you can see at the bottom of the screen, the date, that's running incredibly quickly. I'd love to see what kind of, um, what kind of machine he's got, because that is running really nicely. Let's have a look when it goes over January and see if there's much of a slowdown at all. There's a little bit of one, but it does end very, very quickly. It does end incredibly quickly. I also want to see how much it is on uh, the unthreaded right-hand side. But yeah, you can definitely see that threading is making a huge difference. It's already a year ahead. Uh, almost coming up to January and... Those are, it actually wasn't that as much of a pause as I was expecting. Also, I will say, threading is clearly a negative if you are the Holy Roman Empire, because that will make you, if I just go back to this a second, if uh, threading sucks if you're the Holy Roman Empire, because you will lose Tuscany and Bavaria and uh, Lothringia, probably. Um, but if you're France... Uh, threading is, yeah, you know, not not threading is, is good because France keeps in, you know, whatever, you know, I'm just trying to make the joke, whatever. Uh, Alright, let's uh, move back here. Uh, that's, yeah, no, threading seems to make a very big difference. The red line you see in the video is the time between each frame. For 60 FPS, it should be at or below the green horizontal line. Uh, so we can see the green, hor go away, critical roll. Green horizontal line is right in the middle here. Um, as you see, the difference is staggering. Without the threading, the frame rate is dreadful, and the game progresses far more slowly. With threading, the game progressed 958 days, while without, it only progressed 546 days. That is, it ran 75% faster with threading, and with a far, far better frame rate. The machine I'm running on, oh nice, so you do get to know, uh, is my home PC, which at the time of recording had an i7-477K, GTX 1080, and 16 gigs of 2400 MHz RAM. Uh, that's interesting because the GPU is better than what I have, but I believe my, yeah, no, my, my processor is much better than the 4770K. Um, running at the highest graphical settings, CPU and RAM are both quite old by this point and far outperformed by newer models, though the GPU is still solid. Yeah, I, for, for reference, what I have is a Ryzen R7 2700 and an AMD R9 390 that was overclocked and also 16 gigs of RAM that I think mine is at 3200 megahertz. So yeah, I'm I'm looking forward to getting these kinds of speeds, hell yeah. Very nice. Max speed on this is high enough that I almost never use it. Yeah, no, I can tell that that doesn't seem like something I'd like to play at. Um 
instead mostly using speed 3 and 4 it makes sense. So beyond what has been mentioned, how do we work with performance on CK3? We periodically dedicate time to ensuring that any new performance issues are dealt with and investigating opportunities for further improvement. This often means increased threading or reworking systems to be more performant. One of my favorite ways to make the game faster, however, is by slightly modifying the design to avoid expensive calculations that the player won't be affected by. To take one example, we have to update the progress of the player's council tasks every single day. But for the AI, we only do it once a month. The player is unlikely to ever notice the difference, but this way we reduce the cost of these updates by a thirtieth of what they otherwise would be. And I guess you can consider, for the player's council, there is one council. There is one single player's council. But there are hundreds of AI councils. So, yeah, that makes a big, big difference. Um, it's 1 out of 30 times however many uh, AI councils there are. So, yeah, no, I love it. That's that's a, that's a good one. Um, optimizations like this are all over the place in CK3 and to some extent CK2. There are a lot of small shortcuts that can be done that have a huge impact on performance, but little or no impact on the player experience. Now it's time to talk a bit about the AI as well. Uh, I, can, I can still recall comments about the AI and say, oh, Paradox has no AI programmers and blah, 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 blah. Whatever. Let's move on. But yeah, there's, there's somebody going to complain about this. You, you know it already. We all know it. It's, it's obvious. Uh, the person who started... Uh, sorry, the person who has been in charge for, of the AI for most of CK3's development is Niklas Captain Gars Stried, but he's currently on parental leave. For the past year or so, I've been helping out with the AI, and now in, in his absence, the full responsibility of it has fallen on me. Since I didn't design the AI, this is going to be briefer than it might have been if Niklas was here to write it, but I'll cover some of the basic ideas behind how we've handled the AI in CK3. Our main goal with the AI has been that it should make the game more fun for the player. This has several aspects to it. It should provide some level of challenge, because steamrolling from the get-go isn't fun. It should avoid doing things that are frustrating, even if it would make it smarter, and it should feel if it's plausible actor within a medieval world. These goals all have both overlap and parts where they're in opposition to one another. For instance, avoiding frustration does result in slightly less challenging AI, but that's often a sacrifice that makes sense. Yeah, I think... Um, Frustration, I guess, could be the AI keeps murdering my children, um, or me. You know, it keeps murdering my character, but it would be plausible for it, and it would be challenging for it to do that, because the player is the best player in the game, and he's expanding very rapidly, and the AI is scared, so it murders your kids. Um... Your, your your honor <laughs> your honor I, I i i plead not guilty i was scared that's why i killed his kids uh yeah you know what i mean though like a smart ai would do that because otherwise then you know they fear being conquered by you but that would be incredibly frustrating for the player so yeah, there's, there's a lot of things that you can think about if you've played multiplayer um, of any of the Paradox games, and there's some things that other players do that the AI would never do, that are frustrating as hell. Um, sort of, sort of that. Anyway. Um, one of the biggest structural changes in CK3's AI is how it deals with its military. In CK2, if there were multiple AIs on the same side in a war, they would essentially act independently from one another with some systems for coordination. This usually worked fine, but sometimes it'd lead to a lack of coordination between allies and the AI taking odd decisions. In CK3, we've designed the system from the ground up to handle multiple AIs on the same side. Instead of each AI commanding their own troops, they assign their troops to a war coordinator that handles all decision making. The individual decision making is just what troops to assign, in which uh, kicks in if there are more than one war they could participate in. As such, AIs tend to act in a much more coordinated manner, and I, honestly, I kind of think that that feels more realistic. Like, in a large war situation where there are multiple people on one side like yeah just giving overall command to one general i'm sure that happened i'm damn sure that happened uh but yeah no that that makes total sense however that doesn't address coordination with the player ck2's approach here in the end was to introduce an ai order system where you'd simply tell the ai what to do 
We don't currently have that in CK3, but the AI still has a focus on assisting the player. Generally speaking, the AI will try to keep its armies very close to the player and help out in battles, even if those battles will be lost with its help. An AI order system like in CK2 might still improve this further, but the gap is much smaller than in CK2, so we decided it would not be a priority for release. Additionally, the existence of the order system in CK2 significantly complicated the AI code, making further development of it more difficult. So there's a trade-off to be considered when it comes to the number of bugs it will introduce and the slowdown to AI development it would like uh, it would likely cause. So that covered provides some level of challenge, uh, but what about avoiding frustration? There's a lot of small things here and there designed to do that, but let's talk about a couple of concrete examples. In CK3, the AI at a system I tend to call standard fight. If the player or any other enemy is near its army, will beat it, and there's no real hope of winning the war, as all its troops have already gathered, then instead of running away, the AI will find a nearby defensive location and wait there for up to a month for the enemy to wipe it out. This way, instead of dragging its demise out, it makes a last stand in a good location. The result is that the player doesn't have to chase down armies nearly as much as in CK2, but that only tends to kick in for wars the player is going to win regardless. I love that. I think that's awesome. Especially, you know, find the defensive terrain, make it costly. I love that. That's, that's, that's really good. Similarly, often the game design itself is sent, uh, sorry, is created with the AI at least partially in mind. We've talked about the fort mechanics earlier, but the quick recap is that walking deep into enemy territory without sieging first is going to kill most of your troops. Good. Good. Raid the supply lines. Um, all those caravans of, of food and, and correspondence back to your home territory being raided by the garrisons of the fortresses you fail to siege would absolutely lead to that kind of pain. Good. Uh, the AI will thus virtually never do it. So when you're behind your own lines, you have the time to regroup and figure out what to do. Similarly, there is little temptation to try to chase down AI deep into its territory. This helps keep the focus more on siege warfare, which is very fitting for the era. Yes, it is. Uh, it contributes to every goal I've mentioned. The AI ends up better due to there being fewer options available, so we could make it smarter in picking between those. The player gets less frustrated, and it emphasizes a historical aspect of the era, while avoiding silly chases halfway around the world. Good. Now, that's been a whole lot of talk about military AI. What about the rest of it? The overall approach there is generally been pretty similar to CK2. Though rebuilt from scratch, the AI will periodically check a variety of possible actions, and then take them if they make sense. There's some randomization, and the AI personality affects a variety of actions, to ensure that the game feels alive rather than deterministic. More of the AI can be modded than in CK2, as the interaction system has far less hard coding. There's still parts that are hard coded, such as actions that aren't interactions, but overall it should be possible to influence a bit more of the AI than in CK2. That sounds good. Reduced hard coding has also meant that balancing the AI is easier for us than in CK2, as a programmer doesn't always have to be involved, especially once we get feedback from a large player base after release. This and various architectural improvements in the code compared to CK2 should make iterating on the AI easier than before. Huge parts of what other characters do is also handled by events and so on to a greater extent. Um... Yeah, no, I'm I'm definitely happy than that. Uh, especially, you know, being able to mod the AI is awesome. Like modders should have as much you know freedom as possible because mods really do extend the life cycle of a game significantly. Especially for someone like me who just fucking loves mods. So yeah, no, yeah, I'll I'll definitely take you know less hard coding for sure. It's great. Generally speaking, the goal of non-military AI is to make the world feel alive. This has occasionally meant needing some restrictions to ensure the player doesn't get too overwhelmed. For instance, we've had to run, uh, sorry, we've had to on numerous occasions restrict seduction against the player so they don't get absolutely spammed if they happen to play one of the few female rulers around at game start. Overall, the AI should in many ways feel similar to in CK2, with more of a focus on making the best possible experience for the player. After release, it should be easier for us to further improve on the AI than it was in CK2. Ooh, ooh that looks tasty. That does look tasty. Ooh, hang on, that's an AMD Wraith cooler. With LEDs. That's, this is, yeah. That's not, that's not what he's got up here doing that video. Also, that ankle though. 
<laughs> his newly upgraded PC. Funnily enough, in between when I first wrote this dev diary and when it was set to go out, I decided it was finally time to upgrade my PC. I replaced my aging i7-477K with a nice modern Ryzen 9 three nine thousand oh that's so good 3900x nice very nice and 16 gig of ram with 32 gigs of 3600 megahertz ram so i re-recorded my one minute test with full threading which you can see here um how many 1498 days versus the 700 and so that he had before that's way more 56 more than his old pc uh, so then his old CPU, which was, I think, 75% faster than the non-threaded version. Uh, yeah, no, that is unplayably fast, for sure. Good shit. I like it. My new machine running the game a thousand frames a second, only while paused in one particular corner of the map, though. <laughs> nice. That's all for today, folks. Next week, we'll be back to talk more about modding. Oh, I do love me some modding talk. I'll definitely take that. All right, well, let's pause that so it doesn't keep going. And, uh, yeah, let's have a look into the uh, forums because I'm sure there are some comments to read from the devs. Not that one, though. There we go. So, all very cool stuff. Any idea how fast this compares to CK2? Uh, on his specific machine before the upgrade, CK2 is about as fast as CK3, but with worse frame rate and more stuttering. Uh, he hasn't tried it after upgrading, though. Late game slowdown, however, I'm relatively sure is less than in CK2. That's good to know. Um, the part about threading, and I don't know what frame rate made me feel incredibly dumb. If in summary, in, if in summary it means more fluid game, in, I'm definitely in, for sure. You should have tried to test the game on machines that are below even an i5. I'm sorry. Look, Inspector, we are in the middle of a pandemic, and a lot of uh, Paradox staff are currently at home. Um, Maneth said he tested it on his home machine because he was working from home. Is he supposed to go and purchase a potato just so he can test the game for you? Paradox's studios have a lot of machines, or rather it has lots of components to go in uh, machines to test the game. But when they're all working from home, it's not feasible to you know, go to the office just to test the game, just to do a dev diary. I'm sorry, upgrade your, po upgrade your potato. Yes, people with potatoes should probably be able to play the game if their potatoes re meet the minimum specification of the game. But, like, you should have tried to test the game on machines that blow an i5. I'm sorry, Meneth is being far too kind to you by even responding to you. Go away. Yeah, the game has been tested on i3s. When at the office, like, he did this test on his fucking home PC. Come on now. Blech. What do you mean by threading on and off? Is it hyper-threading activated in the BIOS? Forcing the game's task uh, to only use a single thread. This effectively reduces the game down to just two threads, the game state thread and the render thread. Um, uh, I am not massively computer component literate, um, but I do know a little bit about... CPUs and threading and stuff after building my own PC. Um, I know my own CPU, the Ryzen 7 2700, is 16 core, 32 threads. I think I'm getting that right. It's like double the amount of cores you've got. So he's basically, if I'm right about that, I might be wrong. I might be misremembering something or getting threading mixed up with something else. Um, but as far as I can remember, each core can have two threads. Um, again, might be wrong. Disclaimer. Um, so he's basically using half a core, if I'm right. Which I might not be. Just again. I might be wrong. Anyway, moving on. Um, the, this effectively reduces the game to using two threads, game state thread, and the render thread. Alright, so maybe he's using just a full... He's using one core to do it. Alright. The traits AI have in CK2 gave him certain hidden values. Um, so it's basically the same where traits give values like this. If so, what are the hidden values the AI has now? It's pretty similar. It doesn't quite map one to one to CK2, but the idea is the same. The AI, idea, the AI personality being displayed in the character view helps make it a bit more obvious. So what will the AI do after one month? Uh, and actually, it's not that dumb because standing on defensive terrain might be better than trying to run away and getting caught in bad terrain. Yeah, no, I totally think that that's definitely fair. After a month, it will go back to business as usual since we don't want it appearing brain dead. It's a cooldown three months before it can attempt to stand and fight again. 
I've told the AI that when they're in defensive war and outnumbered, it's not their job to send their troops on the offensive, because in CK2, the AI had very weird priorities in these cases. No, I don't, I disagree with that, because sometimes the best way to prevent, you know, your country from being raided and sacked and sieged is to go and raid and sack and siege the enemy, because then they don't want their country being raided and sacked and sieged, and they'll come home and de-raid, de-sack, and de-siege. Yeah. Uh, the circumstances where it'll do something silly will differ, so there may be some cases where it does worse. Yeah, I mean, just sometimes better, sometimes worse. Will we as modders be able to start our own thread? For example, if I decide to make a mod that adds significant calculation to the game, a relationship calculation, for example, will I be able to call a graphic event, like a short video of a grave at the dead of the last king, spare a thread to handle the calculation, so once the video is over, my calculation is done? No, you can't. Second ring parts of the script system is handed in parallel. So modders can't use extra threads, unfortunately. Um, oh god, that's, that's a big one. Um, you turn that AI and close the gap as much as you want. Control of ally army should be put on the list of basic things should be at launch or right after. No, it shouldn't. That's dumb. That is that's very, very dumb. Why would you want that? No. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, how many players, when asked, would directly tell you I would make the trade-off more complex code and AI just for the army control? Not me. I don't want to control my army, uh, my allies. I want to control my own units. And you know, if it makes sense for the AI to cede control of their army, say they are um, very much below my station. Say I am a king and they are dukes that I am allied to. Yeah, then they may come, and you know, those troops will be assigned to my army, we'll go in together and I'll be in overall control, but if it's just straight allies, no, I should not control your army, it makes no fucking sense. No. This is dumb, and I, I don't agree that more people would think the way you do. It's, no, absolutely not. How many frustrating moments are we going to have being unable to control an ally simply because we've decided to hedge your bets and try and make the AI worth again? Honestly, I kind of don't even want to read more. This is just toxic shit. No, I mean, Meneth, you clearly have more patience than I do if you've talked uh, about it in Discord. But, yeah, fuck this guy. Anyway, um, number one priority should make the AI good and not l let the player take over. Uh, agreed. Only if that fails should other measures be considered. Agreed. In my experience in CK3, the actions of your allies are rarely frustrating, so I don't personally need see a need to be able to control them. However, once we throw hundreds of thousands of players at it, it's possible our opinions there will change. If so, though, it is far more likely we'll go with full control of ally armies rather than an order system. That way we avoid complicating the AI code and thus making the overall military AI worse and buggier and instead just disable the AI for your allies outright. I don't want that. I really don't want that. I really, really don't want that. If it makes sense, like I said, if I'm the king and, you know, I'm allied to dukes, not my vassals, but, like, literally just allied to dukes, then, yeah, they totally could, you know, give me control of their armies or I'd be able to control them, but... If I'm if I'm a duke and I'm allied to a king and it's a situation like here where you know you want to take control of the allies' armies, that's gonna feel fucking stupid. I don't want that at all. Uh, anyway, how much does the GPU have to say for performance? Um, GPU performance can be a bit odd. Usually the impact is pretty minimal as long as the, uh, it's powerful enough to maintain 60 FPS and then gets a bigger and bigger impact on tick speed as it gets worse than that. Going beyond what's needed for 60 FPS does tend to speed the game up a bit, but it's less of a difference than a CPU makes. Yeah, no, that makes sense to me. Uh, one more question. Will big scripts affect performance? Yes. Okay. Next. <laughs> Will be an AI difficulty setting. There's no AI difficulty setting. There's an overall difficulty setting, but that has no effect on the AI code. You almost never see AI settings in strategy games that make the AI smarter at higher levels. Yeah, they just give them bonuses. Because strategy games are usually so complicated that it's no, usually not feasible to make an AI that corresponds to more than normal difficulty, which is why they tend to get boosts instead. Yeah, I don't like that, but yeah, it makes sense. What have been the disadvantages of having the rendering done on the main thread and the game state management in a sub-thread? A uh, thread that handles the UI updating tells the renderer thread to talk to the GPU, so we don't have run, uh, we don't run into any issues there. What I take away from the dev diary is that CK3 will most likely run even faster than CK2 on most systems. Is that correct? Um, so on Menace's machine, before upgrading, tick rate is the same, but the frame rate is significantly better, more stable, basically what we said before. 
A main difference I expect most people with good enough GPUs to run CK3 as well is improved frame rate. Machines beyond four physical cores are likely to do a bit better than CK2 on the tick rate thanks to improved threading. Yay. Um, whatever. What's the horizontal axis of the grap? Seconds, minutes, in-game years. Years. Okay. That's good to know. Will the AI characters have any sense of long-term strategy? The AI code focuses mostly on the short term. Eh, shame, but makes sense. Um, there's a lot of content for rivalries and such, though, and content plays a huge part of how other characters react. Um, God, stop asking about your own systems. I don't care. Uh, how many types of graphical settings are there in CK3? Standard 3D graphic settings plus some CK3, uh, CK specific stuff. Good. Uh, lots and lots of comments to reply to. Uh, what about AI behavior when it's in a few wars? It will focus on one unless it has troops to handle more than one. All right. Um, if I recall, recall correctly, Imperator did not have it, but you have uh, SSAO option for people with high-end GPU. We've got SSAO for the character portraits. Nice. Does the AI actively try and secure its dynasty through marriages and producing heirs? Yeah, Imperator does have a little bit of a problem with that, so it's a good question. The AI marries quite a bit, yes. Uh, taking the vows is handled in AI script. I'm not familiar with how that's balanced. So yeah, hopefully we won't see as many, you know, AI sending their um, heirs off to become celibate. Um, in other words, we have the usual devices to simulate the appearance of long-term behaviors as in CK2, but without any true strategic AI behind the AI characters. Uh, yes. All right. Uh, why complicate the code when it already works quite well? Honestly, if it works, then fine. I don't see a problem with that. Um, is Marriage AI also handled by the script? Uh, marriage AI is a mix of code and script. Uh, in CK2, there are these political reasons for quite a lot of interactions, and they still there are replaced with more concrete reasons. Political reasons is no longer a thing. Acceptance reasons are much clearer than in CK2. Okay, lovely. Um, good dev diary. Definitely a good dev diary. I liked it a lot. That's uh, it, was a, it was a deep one, very much a very deep dev diary, um, going into things that I think are going to go over some people's heads. But all in all, it was um, it was good to learn some of these things. Um, get, again, getting a, a look behind the curtain on what, um, what what's going on behind the scenes. I like it. It's good stuff. Uh, anyway. I'm going to put a cut in there, so thank you all very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this dev diary video. It was a pretty long one. Um, if you liked it, feel free to click the like button. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section below. And if you want to keep up to date with all CK3 news and updates, then go ahead and uh, hit the subscribe button. Thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.